Good morning. Welcome to Class Again Together. We are continuing our study of the life of Moses. Today we're going to find out what happens in the desert when the people have to learn something that will come in to, to their play with their life with God for the rest of their existence, including ours. I think it's harder to learn than it appears. There's some people need to they need to see something in order to learn. There are others though that they they just it's just that would be static to them because they need to hear something and the visuals get in the way. But there are some people like mechanics, for instance, that I admire because they don't do well with manuals, but they can take apart an engine and put it back together again just by handling the pieces and knowing where they go. It's almost intuitive with them. So how do you learn best? No matter whether you're visual or auditory or kinesthetic, at the root, we all learn the same way. Experience is the best teacher. No one learns the first time, but it's through the repeated experiences that we learn what really is taking place and what we need to do and what gets ingrained into us. We learn to relate to others when we see the hurt, what hurts or helps relationship. We learn to write by writing and then making erasures. That's what Paul says to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He approaches the same lesson we're going to examine today, but from the distance of history. He says, For I do not want you unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the spirit, same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. He takes his audience back to the Sinai wilderness in those difficult days after the joy of the Exodus fades away quickly. In it we can read our own autobiography. God gets annoyed when people don't learn the lesson he's trying to teach them. That's why Paul goes on to say, Now these things took place as examples for us that we may not desire evil as they did. He's trying to teach a lesson. Paul says, pay attention to these people and their failings. Because many times the best lessons are learned from bad examples. Parents many times will take a teenager uh, who is a, a reckless driver or thinks he's better than he is. And, but when another teen dies in a traffic accident, that's the moment they can tell their son or their daughter. That's why you pay attention. That's why you don't speed when you drive. That's why you put your phone up and you don't look at it. Their experience can help us keep from going down the same road. So today, we turn southward into a large expansion of desert known as the Wilderness of Shin, where Israel and us must learn the hardest lesson of all to learn, that we must and can depend on God rather than ourselves. When we read this section of Exodus, there are a lot of things that stand out. First, there's the idea of grumbling with the people. It seems to be prevalent, as, as prevalent as a bored toddler on a road trip. But the second concept is that God uses what God uses to train His children, a concept called testing. Listen to what Deuteronomy says that describes what God is trying to accomplish in the desert. And you shall remember that the whole way the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness that He might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep His commandment or not. The test was of obedience. But there's really another way of thinking about this. Obedience simply means I depend on God's will rather than my own, and I trust it so I will follow it. The test asks a single question. Will you depend on God or yourself? So exactly what is a test? Now we come to this word sitting in a hard desk in a classroom. A teacher passes out paper with questions. We answer the questions. But what's the purpose of the test? Usually today it's to measure what you already know. But I'd like to propose that's a bad test. A teacher should teach you what you lack, not what you have. Where do you, 
what do you, where do you need to learn? You know, where's those areas that you're weak? Where are you deficient? A test really is a tool for learning more than just a measure of past learning. I realized that when I was a senior in high school. I took first year German as a junior because at that time I wanted to become an aeronautical engineer like that happened. I signed up for second year German thinking that I could keep going with that. When classes returned in late August, I went into class and took my seat. The teacher who I had had the first year suddenly passed out paper that was clear it was a test. First day of class, after a summer break, we all had to complete it. And when she came back the next day, she did nothing more than berate us for how poorly we did and how much we had forgotten in the summer. Now, while both of those might have been true, we really didn't need the teacher telling us that. The test revealed it, and it would give us a springboard for the future. And whether it was right or not, I grew irritated and went to the counselor and dropped the class. After all, the test really didn't do what it was supposed to do, which was to teach me more German. God's test examines a single issue. Does God give you what you need? Now, there are three terms I want us to kind of get clear on some ideas here. These terms, are, I think, are important for us to understand as we go forward in our lesson in the book of Exodus. It, the distinctions are important because that's always that's hiding in the bushes of both the Israelites and of us. The first is need. We have needs, things that we require for survival. We need food to eat, water to drink, clothes to cover us, and protection from the elements. Without them, we'll perish. We have needs. But then there's this thing called want. And if you ever talk to a, a kid in a toy store, they will always point to something, and they'll say, I need that. And you need to correct their language. They want that. Want goes one more step than need. It's what I would prefer to happen. It's what I want to take place. We need food to eat, but I want a sirloin steak. We need water to drink, but I prefer that expensive Perrier water. We, have, we need clothes to wear, but designer clothes, that's what I want. We need shelter, but a 4,000 square foot house with a hot tub and a swimming pool is not the same. That's what we want. And then the next step up is the term expectation. Expectation takes both want and needs and creates a demon out of it. Want and need are beyond our control. But then when God comes in, that is when we expect Him to give in to our wants and our needs. If we're His children, if He loved us, we say, wouldn't He want us to be happy? That's called expectation. And it takes our wants and couples them with this expectation to make a monster out of it. Because the problem with expectation is when we don't get what we expect to get, we grow disappointed, really sullen. As, and as we come to the concept of grumbling in this lesson, they, it always arises from a misplaced set of expectations. And today, when people grumble and complain about life, it comes not because they don't have what they need. It's because they're not getting what they expected. We expect God to do what we want when we want it. But there's so many people who become spoiled brats in God's household, throwing a fit when God doesn't deliver. The last term we want to look at is the term demand. No longer is it God's gift that's important. That's not enough for us anymore. We want to tell the Almighty how He is supposed to treat us so that we will be happy and satisfied. He is our butler. We snap our fingers and says, hop to it. That's called demand. Not one of us, not one of us takes demands easily. And that includes, both includes Moses and God too. They don't like someone demanding things from them. Now, see, we see this, these things come into play in our desert diorama. It says, Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went in the wilderness of Shur, and they went 
three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah, which means bitter. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log, and he threw it in the water, and the water became sweet. And it's there the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, that, and there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to my voice, the voice of the Lord your God, and do which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all of his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord your healer. Then they came to Elam, where there were twelve springs of water and seventy palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. Here in that long passage, it gives us an overview of everything we're looking at today. They come to the vast wilderness of shore. They have left the Red Sea. It's been three days. The limit that people can survive without, with water. They are feeling the effects of dehydration, for sure. They expected something. They needed something. They wanted something. And they expect God to give them water, but now they doubted. They grumbled. See, their expectation is not met, and so it grows into disappointment. Grumbling is a low growl of discontent. It is a murmur. It begins to eat up the soul as the words are whispered internally. A driver in traffic, for instance, comes to a road that starts to be backed up and they realize the lights are out and they can always start to grumble and say, don't they know how to keep traffic flowing in this town? When expectations are not met, we complain and grumble. It's that simple. God was supposed to give them water to drink, they expected wherever they went, there would be a fresh flowing stream. There would always be fresh water. But when they were pressed, they grew dissatisfied. Because God wasn't meeting their expectations. They found this oasis that looked pretty promising. Frankly, it had palm trees and the appearance of water. But, the, so, but they scooped up a handful and tasted it. And it was bitter, a word that might indicate that it had... Uh, salt, but not as much salt as seawater. It was just undrinkable. They placed the call the place Mara, which means bitter. And yet, Exodus says God was testing them. Would they believe God? Would they follow his commands? Did they trust him enough that when he said to do various things, they would do that? It will become pivotal when we get to the law of Moses in a few chapters. Would God provide? He proves it over and over again. Even though they walked through the Red Sea, God showed Moses his log. He threw it into the water and it became sweet. They now see the Red Sea. They've seen bitter water become sweet. And they move on. And God continues to meet their needs because they come to Elam and there was a lot of water there. Why did God lead them to Elam? because he was supplying their needs. The lesson was clear. If God can turn brackish water to sweet, he should be followed and obeyed because he has our best interest in heart. God made them a promise to keep that they would be safe from the diseases he inflicted upon the Egyptians, things we saw during the, during the plagues. If they obeyed, but it all comes down do they trust God to deliver on his promises? Because no one obeys someone if they do not believe and trust them first. So God takes the steps to create the trust before he gives the commands. And what we find in this is three different tests. In this first section of Exodus, there are these three tests that God gives his people. And all of them are our tests as well. The first test is the test of patience. Now, I imagine that after the delivery at the Red Sea, the assumption was, we're going to get on the express train bound for the Promised Land. But then came the reality. 
they set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Shen, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. Six weeks now had passed, and they're in the middle of the desert. They're nowhere close to this land flowing with milk and honey, this land of promise, this land that Abraham and his descendants would give. And they probably were asking the question, at least we would, I think, why can't we get to the promised land now? Why are we out here in the middle of nowhere? Now, we've all seen this in action. If you ever take a long car trip, you get this, you got to keep, when you're growing, when you've got a young family, you're going along, you're going to grandma's house, you're going on vacation, it makes a difference where you're going, but it makes, but if you have a small child or several small children, and you're making this two-day trip, it's going to take two days to get to, get to where you're going, They'll sit on the back seat and they'll watch this endless parade of road signs. And about every four or five minutes, they'll say, Are we there yet? How much longer? And believe me, a car ride like that is not a picnic for the adults in the car either. See, on the map, it looks pretty simple. You leave Egypt, you go due west or due east, and you come to the welcome to Canaan sign on the highway. Yet it looks like God's causing them to go the long way around. See, patience requires us to think that God must have a reason for this, and God does have a reason. He has a lot to do before he gets into the promised land. But the people in their impatience with God start to grumble again. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, and people said to them, Would that we have died at the hand of the Lord in Egypt, when we had meat, pots, and we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us to this wilderness to kill this whole assembly of hunger. They did what a lot of people do. They made what I call the good old days speech. Remember the good old days? That was the time of golden sunshine and great plenty. We had happiness then. We had meat to eat in Egypt. We could pack our bellies full of bread. But now they brought us out here so we can starve to death. Notice what happens in this situation. They turn on Moses and Aaron. They're the ones at the front of the line. You let us here. But when they remember, they forget at the same time. People tend to have selective memories, remembering only the positive and ignoring the problems that were they were having. They never talked in this little speech about, yeah, but we were slaves in Egypt. I remember those long days working in the mud pits, and it was terrible. We didn't know what was going to happen. I saw my, my friends get beaten to death by those slave masters. Those bricks were hard to make. My hands still bear the scars of them. They ignored the blessings of freedom and focused only on their stomachs. Only their appetites, only their likes, only their wants, only their expectations. And that's part of the problem with patience. I want what I want, I want it now. In my first church, old timers like to say, I wish we could go back to the old Brush Arbor meetings in the summer. And they'd retreat into this fantasy of their minds, and they thought that about the two weeks in July under the tent outdoors with great fondness and, and glowing nostalgia. And I listened to them in my 20s, and I thought, but you haven't remembered some things, have you? In July, it's hot and humid. There were mosquitoes all around, and you're going to be out here in this field under this tent, and it's going to be hot, and you're going to have chiggers all over you by the time you get finished. What about those things? But those all get erased, saying, oh, I long for what I used to have. What we had is what we knew. What we don't have is what we don't know. But God is taking his time takes time in their life, and he takes time in yours. Now, we'd love to think that there was an expressway between the baptistry and heaven, for instance. You come out of the water, and you get instant bliss. 
But you know, there's this gap, huge gap, between when a person is baptized into Christ and when heaven gets there for them. Very few people step out of the baptistry, have a heart attack, and go to heaven. In my 60-something years, never happened. It's always farther away. It's always something that you have to do somehow. And though we face life and its many challenges, we, we, there's the difficulties all in between. You have to struggle with temptation. You have to struggle with faith. You, you have to grow. And some of that is not pleasant. You have to learn to get, around, get along with God's people. And some of them are not pleasant either. And we ask the question, when is this going to happen? I don't like this, this period where I have to struggle. I don't like this period where I have to, have to, to go through this, all of this difficulty. I want to know, have, I want heaven on earth, frankly. But the answer from God is, He's not ready for you yet. From time to time, I have to sit by a bedside of someone who's dying from terminal cancer. They're suffering a great deal. Almost all the time, they ask exactly the same question. Why is it that God doesn't go ahead and take me? Why is he leaving me here? Now, I'll confess to you, I don't have the best answer to this question. I don't know that anybody does. In the mind of God, he has his own reasons. But I have one that I think is the principle behind this passage and so many others in the Bible. God is not finished with you yet. You still have something to do in this life before you get to the next one. Will God provide for their lives even when life is slow and crawling? That's hard to do when we want everything now and God says later. The second test is the test of hunger. Their complaint was, we have nothing to eat. They grumbled and said, we had all this food here, and now you brought us out here so we die of hunger. Yet, God's going to feed them. But this is another test. I will give them bread from heaven to see if they'll walk with me or not. So in Exodus chapter 16, it says, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather it a day's portion every day, that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they, are, when they prepare to bring it in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Aaron and Moses said to the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. He sent what was called manna. We learn from Exodus chapter 16 and verse 15 that the term, the Hebrew term manna means, what is it? They had never seen anything like it. It defied description. And uh, it says, Moses said, this is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. It was similar to coriander seeds, but it tasted like wafers and honey. I, the only way I can describe it is it, it must have had a, a, a flavor like a graham cracker. It had some, some sweetness, but also some coarseness to it. But it came with instructions. The instructions were important. They could gather everything they wanted every day, but it wouldn't keep till the next morning. You ate what you gathered because the next morning it would rot. It would have worms in it. And so every day, you had to go out and gather the bread. You had to gather the manna, except the day preceding the Sabbath. Then they could gather twice as much, and it would stay through the Sabbath day, but not to the third day. So just think about this. God says, this is what's, how it's going to work. This is what you need to do. But they go, I don't like that. I don't like having to go out every day. What I think I'll do is on Monday, I'll collect a week's worth. It's more efficient. It's what pleases me. It lets me be lazy the rest of the week. So 
they collect all of this and they find themselves hungry the rest of the week. What is God teaching them? Every day you get the bread that feeds you and your family. It is the bread from God and God is feeding you every day. He gives you what you need. Jesus uses this same image in the Lord's Prayer. One of the phrases says, Give us this day our daily bread. It probably means enough bread for today. The prayer emphasizes a single idea that God will provide you enough to keep you alive. He'll not let you starve to death. He won't let you go hungry, but He will give you enough. It may not be what you want, but He'll give you everything you need. Think about how big that principle is. He may not give you calm in your life, but He'll give you power to deal with the difficulties. Or as Paul would say to the Corinthians, He told me, I'm going to leave the thorn in your flesh, but give you the power to overcome it. The concept of daily bread is a huge concept for faith. But you see, in an age of overflowing foodstuffs and growing obesity, it, it seems absolutely ridiculous to think this way. We'll store back for months or even years. We still have rice on our shelves that we bought during the pandemic because we were afraid they would sell out and we wouldn't have anything to eat. It was a just-in-case. God says, I don't like just-in-cases. I'll give you what you need. I won't let you starve. But see, it asks you to, it, it forces us to ask a huge question about the essentials of life. Will God give you what you really need? Everything about what Christianity teaches is that God will give you everything you need. Do you believe a God like that? Can you trust a God like that? Will you give your life to a God like that? Will you do what He asks you to do, even if it doesn't make sense, because you know He has your best interest at heart? That goes to the heart of faith, complete dependence on God. But there is one last test that exists, one that was previously encountered, so it should have been easy to answer. It was the test of thirst. Now, it's not like God had not given them water before. And they'd been back at Mara, and, and Mara, they saw that log cast in the water, and the, the, the bitter turned into sweet. God can provide water. He can provide water out of bad water. But memories dry throats. And now, the need for water comes, and the expectation grows again. So in Exodus chapter 17, they move from the wilderness of Shin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and they camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt? To kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Second time they made that, that accusation. Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They're about to stone me. Understand, this was not a plea and this was not a request. This was a demand. Give us water to drink. Moses, work your magic. I don't care what you have. Snap your fingers. Find that log. Do what it takes. I don't care what it is. But you're responsible for getting us to do this. And they decided then that Moses didn't care. You know, there's a, an easy way you can slip over. It's that if God didn't give me what I wanted, he must not care about me. Tough times will bring out how much you believe about God and how much you don't. After all, there are times that some people ask the same question, at least inside, where is God when I need Him? Moses grows frustrated because he can't conjure up water out of thin air. 
it tells us that anger level had reached its zenith. I mean, it was, it was about to break into violence. So God, in, their te in his test, has a plan. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff from which you struck the Nile, and go, and behold, I'll stand before you there at the rock of Horeb. And you shall strike the rock, and the water will come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah, because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? He says to Moses, Go back and do what you did in the beginning. Make this very, very public. Walk in front of the people so they'll see you. Take the elders with you so they'll have to witness this. Take that staff in your hand, the same staff you struck the Nile to make it blood, and you go to this massive boulder and you bang on it. And he did, and water came out of the rock. A total impossibility. Notice what the last verse said. They were testing God as well. Is the Lord among us or not? God showered his presence and his care at that moment. It should have put an end to the, to, to the quarreling, but it won't. Now, ask, have you asked, stood and ever asked yourself a blunt question? What has God done in my life for my benefit? I think it's a helpful thing to take time on a regular basis and make a list of just all the things God has done for you today. Ignore all the rest of your life because you'll be overwhelmed by the list and you'll quit. Perhaps you've ignored what God is doing for what is best for you. The Israelites did. Why can't you? Their journey would continue, and the test would also continue. They do for us as well. There is not a day that we live when God does not ask us a single simple question. Do you trust me to guide your life or not? He asks that question because too many people want to be master and commander of their own lives. And it's out of those times that we must confront three great truths. When our comfort is stressed, it tests our faith in God and His power. There's a reason why we struggle. Because it forces us to stop and ask in different, difficult times, am I relying on God at this moment? Or am I doing this on my own? It's a test. Our own life is a test to see if you're willing to put your whole life into His hands or not. And it exposes everything that we believe all the time and shows us what we need to do next. So what are your tests? Are you passing them or falling short? But the second thing is, do I believe that God will give me what I need? Now, it's easy to trot out the platitude, God will provide, and then doubt it when life grows difficult. In the midst of things like cancer, unemployment, difficulties with your family, we always have to confront ourselves, do I believe that God will give what I need right now? See, the, the answer is found in both history and experience. God proves it over and over again to the Israelites. Faith is believing that God, the God of the past, is also the God of the present and the future. If He delivers back then, He'll deliver again. If He took care of us then, He'll take care of us now. If He gives us what we need then, He'll give us what we need now. Do you believe God that much? But the third is if you don't learn that lesson, you're always going to be destined to repeat it. You know, the, the, the testing lessons of God, that's not a one-shot thing. Instead, every day, we get asked, life asks us the question, do you believe that God will give you enough to provide for your needs? 
Do you believe, did you do that this morning when you got up? That I believe that God would provide the needs that I have today no matter what. See, we trust, we want to trust Him to provide food, life, of life and with food and what we need. That's what we need. But we live in an anxious world in which things uh, in that world collapse. And in our anxiety, God is keep asking the question, the basic question. Do you really believe that I'll give you what you truly need? When you're all balled up, can you stop and say, God will get me through this. God will have be with me no matter what. God will climb the mountain with me if I need to climb a mountain. God will give me food when I am hungry. God will find a way to give me water when I'm thirsty. Now that seems so strange. But that's the essence of faith, because if you ever believe that God can do anything He says is going to do for you, you better follow Him and all that He says. And so our answer always comes in living according to His Word. So how are you doing on your test? We're glad that you joined me today. Hope we've uh, had a good time together studying the Word of God. Next week we'll be back and we'll look at Moses as he stressed in his leadership capacity and how a single idea changes his entire life. So thank you again for being with me. I hope you have a great day and I'll see you again next Sunday.